the Burned End Park disaster, unfolding on March 9, 1946, wasn't just a tragic accident, it was a stark indictment of inadequate crowd control and a chilling foreshadowing of similar tragedies to come. Imagine the scene, Bolton, England, a town brimming with the hope of post-war normalcy, its football stadium, Burned End Park, ready to host a highly anticipated FA Cup match between Bolton Wanderers and Stoke City. This wasn't just any match, Stanley Matthews, a footballing legend, graced the Stoke team, drawing an immense crowd, a crowd far exceeding expectations. The war had ended, and the pent-up desire for large-scale public gatherings, for the thrill of a live sporting event, fueled a surge of attendees. But the stadium, while an improvement on its predecessor, Pike Lane, wasn't designed for the sheer number of people it would soon hold. Wasn't there a glaring oversight in not anticipating the potential for such a massive turnout, especially given Matthew's presence? This begs the question, did the organizers truly comprehend the scale of the potential risk? The inadequate number of turnstiles at the railway end, a consequence of the stadium's wartime repurposing, compounded the problem, creating a dangerous bottleneck, a funnel for a human torrent. Think about it, the sheer pressure of thousands of people funneling through limited entry points, a pressure that built and built until it exploded in catastrophic consequences. The legacy of the war, with its rationing and controlled environments, had perhaps numbed some to the danger of unchecked crowd surges. The incident itself was a horrifying cascade of events. The turnstiles were closed, but determined fans still found ways in. Some clambered over, others circumvented the barriers altogether. A gate, left carelessly opened by a departing spectator, further exacerbated the throng at the railway end. Inside the stadium, the already densely packed stands became unbearable. People started to feel claustrophobic, attempting to leave, only to add to the growing chaos. The pressure mounted, intensifying until the inevitable happened, two railings at the railway end gave way, unleashing a devastating crush. Can you imagine the sheer terror, the overwhelming force of the crowd pressing down, the suffocating weight of bodies? Hundreds of people tumbled forward, a human wave crashing onto the already crowded pitch. Those at the front were crushed, those behind them fell on top, a horrific domino effect of bodies. The air must have been filled with screams, cries for help, the thud of bodies hitting the ground. Even more chilling is the fact that amidst the chaos, those who fainted were routinely passed over the heads of the crowd onto the pitch, a common practice that tragically blurred the lines between the unconscious and the dead. How could such a practice exist in a context that was so potentially dangerous? The investigation, led by lawyer and politician Malwin Hughes, was a critical step, though arguably too little, too late. Hughes' report highlighted critical flaws in crowd management and stadium design. He recommended implementing mechanical turnstile counters, calculating maximum safe capacities, and mandating regular inspections. A subsequent conference on sports arena regulation put forth stronger measures, including improved internal communication systems, something Burned End Park desperately lacked. But crucially, these recommendations remained largely unenforced. The government opted for self-regulation, a strategy that proved tragically ineffective. Wasn't there a failure of leadership, a lack of urgency in enacting meaningful change in the wake of such a devastating loss of life? The recommendations were available, and yet the government seemed hesitant to impose stricter measures, instead placing the burden of safety on the very organizations that had demonstrably failed. This inaction left stadiums vulnerable, paving the way for future tragedies. The legal outcome, 
or rather the lack thereof, was as devastating as the event itself. No one was prosecuted for the deaths, a decision that underscored the systemic failures and the inadequate response to the disaster. The tragedy became less about individual culpability and more about a broader failure of responsibility. The legacy of Burn Den Park is a sobering reminder of the importance of rigorous crowd control and effective government regulation. While benefits matches were organized to raise money for victims, and plaques were later erected at the stadium and the disaster site, these actions felt like insufficient gestures given the scale of the catastrophe. The disaster wasn't just a Bolton tragedy, it was a national failure, a failure to learn from the loss of 33 lives. The current status of the Burned End Park site reflects the often difficult relationship between memory and progress. The stadium is gone, replaced by a supermarket, a stark reminder of the ephemeral nature of both places and events. The plaques serve as poignant memorials, yet they barely scratch the surface of the suffering endured. The Bolton Wanderers still acknowledge the disaster, ensuring it isn't forgotten, but the wider public consciousness has largely moved on. The Burned End Park disaster serves as a case study in what happens when the safety of a crowd is deemed secondary to the pursuit of entertainment and profit. The event highlights the critical need for robust safety measures and stringent regulations, which, unfortunately, were not implemented swiftly or thoroughly enough to prevent future crowd-related tragedies. The disaster's legacy extends far beyond Bolton. It stands as a grim testament to the enduring need for proactive, stringent safety protocols at large-scale public events, a lesson that is tragically still being learned today.